right, well, um, welcome friends to week five. I realize this is like maybe even two months since we wrapped up the tap class in person. Uh, I was never planning to do this. I thought I could get away with not recording this, uh, but a few of you have asked uh, and ask and you shall receive. So this is week five. Um, I'm gonna do a truncated message because I think the reality is, is like this conversation about brothers and sisters, if you were tracking with us, we started in the garden, right? What was God's design for men and women? And then we talked about what happened after the fall. And then from there, we talked about different men and women in the scriptures who did partner together, some really beautiful examples, which then brings us to the Mac Daddy passage that everyone points to, uh, which is in 1 Timothy. And so you've waited, your, your patience is being rewarded. We are going to talk about it. But hopefully I've been able to make an argument or at least present some information to show, hey, this is why this is not a cut and dry, boom, that's what the passage says. Like hopefully you've been able to see sort of this, this, there's this design that we want to move toward in the end. And we talked about that from the scriptures and then from church history and all of that throughout the weeks. But um, I know this is the passage everybody wants to talk about. This one, and there's one in 1 Corinthians, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to tackle the Timothy one. Um, and if the 1 Corinthians one interests you, call me and we'll chat. So, all right. But, of course, the goal of all Christian instruction is always worship. Uh, and so that has not changed. And so um, here's just a question. Hit pause as you guys are, are weighing out this video and getting ready to jump into this passage. Take a moment and ask yourself, if you could stand before God right now, by the way, you are standing before God right now. But let's say you could see him face to face. What would you say? Uh, and just take a moment. Allow yourself to meditate on that. Imagine that. Imagine what God might look like. You're in the garden. You're walking with him. What would you say? All right. So once you've done that, then we will jump in. Um, okay. So the text you've all been waiting for, we're going to jump into the Mac Daddy of all. But here's, here's where I think anybody who's being humble and honest with the scriptures should arrive at a conclusion similar to Dr. Bach. And so here's what I'm gonna say, because the reality is, is I'm gonna teach this passage to the best of my ability to what I believe God has revealed to me is the more accurate interpretation of how do we wrestle with this passage, but you may not agree with me and that's okay. But where I hope that we will have agreement is in what Dr. Bach has to say. And so here's what he has to say. The women's debate, so this idea, can women teach? Can they, can they preach? Can they lead? Can they be pastors? This debate centers not just on individual texts. You know, you try to grab these individual texts, but on how various kinds of texts relate to each other. That is, the scripture has texts that affirm the rights of women in an unqualified way, along with texts that describe them as engaged in various practices, which we've talked about, but it also has passages that affirm restrictions in practice. The crucial question becomes which passages control the discussion, the passages where no limits seem to be expressed or those that do. Different sides take different positions based on whether they regard the non-restricted text to be more fundamental to or determining the view of the restricted text. This is a guy who works at Dallas Theological Seminary, a complementarian seminary, and he's saying, listen, let's be honest about the fact that there are texts that talk about women doing these things, that describe women doing these things, and then we have these restrictive texts. And you have to have a conversation with how you relate those two things, because to ignore either of them uh, is scriptural malpractice. I do not want to ignore passages that are inconvenient to me. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to dismiss them. I don't want to, you know, regard them as not important. But I also want them to have a conversation with the rest of Scripture. One of the rules of Scripture interpretation is we let the more clear passages help us understand the less clear ones. And I would argue the one that we're jumping into today, this 1 Timothy 1, is a fairly unclear passage. So let me read the whole passage to you. My Bible's over here. One second. Because I want you to see some of the difficulty with interpreting this entire thing. So 1 Timothy chapter 2. Um, well, I'll get to this in a second. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 to 15. This is the word of the Lord. 
This is Paul speaking to Timothy, who's ministering in Ephesus, okay? So all this is going to matter. Paul is writing Timothy, who's in Ephesus. Okay, and that's what he says. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Also, the women are to dress themselves in modest clothing with decency and good sense, not with elaborate hairstyles, gold pearls, or expensive apparel, but with good works, as is proper for women who profess to worship God. A woman is to learn quietly with full submission. I do not allow a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Adam, instead, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. But the woman was deceived and transgressed, but she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with good sense. Okay, so that's the passage. That's the one that everybody comes back to and says, what? hey, it says it right here. I can put my finger, chapter and verse, boom, women are not to teach and have authority. And you say, okay, so what's going on in this passage? Well, first of all, no one knows. So I just want to be honest about that. If you were to take 10 commentaries... And even if you were to take 10 commentaries by 10 conservative scholars, okay, and this is like a paper that Martin and I read as we were preparing, you know, St. Jude for why are we comfortable with my role and the, and the things that I do on Sunday morning with you all? Why is it that are we just like shoving this under a rug, this verse? Are we just ignoring First Timothy? Like what are we doing with this passage? And one of the things that was really beautiful as a Reformed guy who is conservative, who does believe women should not preach, and teach in Sunday morning worship, he said, but hey, I think it would be a generous posture of us to admit that none of us are actually entirely clear what Paul is talking about here. And he used 10 different men who all arrived at the same conclusion that women should not preach and teach, but how they got there and how they interpreted these passages, all different. So here's my point. And even the people, and listen, and the people who think women should preach and teach, you read their commentaries, and there's a little bit of like, this is a weird passage, okay? So first things first, this passage is strange. Secondly, we don't stick to all of what it says. So men do not lift hands in prayer most of the time. So it's not this prescriptive, like I want men to pray with hands without anger, okay? So, and what's interesting is that anger piece, I don't hear harped on a lot. And yet I know a lot of angry men. Who pray and I wonder if they would allow this text to press in on them if that would mean something secondly women wear gold and pearl right I'm wearing this is this is not gold or pearl but it's titanium it's a precious metal like there's something happening in this text that seems to be very specific to Ephesus is what I'm getting at and we on the outside 2,000 years removed people who are trying to look in on an ancient city who weren't there during that time we're all trying to go, we think we know what it means, but cultural humility would allow us to say, hey, we're doing the best we can. So first of all, we don't obey all of it. And one of the things, like it says, women will be saved through childbearing. Like, what does that mean? I mean, again, like, what? What does that mean? Okay. Secondly, there are weird words in this passage. So in the original Greek, we have what's called hapax legomena, and these are words that are just used one time in the scriptures, okay? So they're words that might be popular outside of the scriptures, but for whatever reason, they're just not in the vocabulary toolbox of the writers of scripture. And so we have several of them. And listen, they're rare. They don't happen that often. And yet in this passage, we have authentain, we have catastole, we have idos, we have like these like words for authority, attire, modesty, reverence, braided hair, godliness, bearing of children, like these specific words that Paul is using to write to Timothy he's not using anywhere else in the scripture and again Paul writes a lot of scripture it seems to be a specific vocabulary for a specific context and this is what I'm going to get at and so this idea this hey pax legomena well the reason why we pay attention to that is probably Paul is addressing something specific that's happening in Ephesus and he's using the language of Ephesus so he's using vocab that they would understand. So, for example, you might go to Portland, Oregon. They have no football team. They doesn't seem like a real sporty town to me. Uh, I mean, they have the Trailblazers, but and you might go, yeah, you know how it is. We them boys. Now, if you're in Dallas and you say that, everyone knows what you're talking about, which is a heartbreaking phrase. I know we, yeah. Anyways, 
but there are going to be people, or go to Mexico City and say, weed in boys. You're going to be like, I don't really know what that means, right? That's probably what's happening here, is Paul is using language that would be very specific to the Ephesians, and he's doing that on purpose. Y'all, I just have this fear that I'm not recording. One second. good we're recording it's been a while since i've done this and i was like starting to replay maybe i didn't hit play but anyways okay so that's why this whatever paul is talking about to timothy whatever he's trying to say about women the way they dress childbearing teaching with authority men with lifted hands scholars think hey this might be jargon that the ephesians would be familiar with okay which happens all the time in the scriptures there's language that is very specific happens in philippians it happens in romans it's language that Paul is trying to write to the people in a way that they would understand. Thirdly, when you think about this passage, if you remember back, and I know this is like several weeks removed, there was a gal specifically who taught Apollos, okay? It was Priscilla. Where were they? And the answer is Ephesus. So here's Priscilla teaching Apollos in Ephesus. Is this a contradiction of scripture? Which is a good question to ask, okay? Like, is this thing that Priscilla's doing sinful? Doesn't seem to be, it seems to be something that Paul is commending, but that's another problem for us to have to address. And fourthly, finally, when trying to interpret any passage, okay, what's the first rule of real estate? First rule of real estate is location, location, location. The first rule of understanding scripture, of trying to figure out what does this passage mean, is context, context, context. We we have this beautiful, this scripture is an unbelievable inheritance. I mean, Christians in the early church were known as people of the book. And the Jewish people had their scrolls. Like, this is, like, this is an incredible thing that the God of the universe would say, I want you to know me. And I'm going to make it to where you can know me through this book and through my spirit and through teaching and through like we don't this isn't the only way, but it is a unbelievably precious gift from God. But there are so many people in the church today and maybe you're one of those people and you're like, I hear you like I hear you say the scriptures are a gift like I hear you say, "Ooh, what a treasure it's from God. But if I'm being honest, sometimes I open it up and I get to reading and I'm like, I don't know who this guy job is and I don't know why he's lost everything and why is his friend Ellie phase the Tsunamite and Bilda the Shuha like I don't this doesn't make any sense to me so hear me the beautiful gift that scripture is requires that we trans like trans continental trans timonental trans like covenantal trans like there there is so many cultural time geography Socio, like, like, there's a lot of boundaries to just an immediate understanding. Like, if I handed you People magazine and I said, read this, interpret this, you'd be like, I understood every word of that. And if I didn't understand it, I context clues gave me plenty. Right? I got it. Like, right now, like, you, like, right now, we could just be like, oh, man, the vid, man, it's coming for us. Like, I am ducking for Omicron. That sentence five years ago is gibberish. And that sentence 100 years from now is something only history nerds are going to be able to make sense of, okay? So there is a massive time, space, cultural gap. But that's one of the beautiful things about studying the scriptures is you can figure out a way to get back in. So, But it does require of us to say, hey, in order to understand the scripture, there's probably some context I need to know. This is just true. This is just good Bible study. So people are like, oh, you don't need all that. You just open it up, chapter, verse. That's what it says. That's what it means. No, that's, that's insane, okay? It requires sometimes that we have context in order to understand it, and it's worth it. It's worth learning the context. It's wildly fascinating. It's why I'm excited for this lesson. Um, so with that being said, I think in order to make sense of what Paul is saying to Timothy, you have to understand what's going on in Ephesus because I believe the reason why Paul is using such specific jargon and why he's addressing such specific things like the way women are dressed and childbearing is because I believe the context of Ephesus and their worship of a goddess named Artemis, that's the background context that if we knew it, I 
I think, would color and highlight that letter of 1 Timothy so that we, like the first recipients, would go, we know what Paul's talking about. We know exactly what he's talking about. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about the context going on in Ephesus with Artemis cult worship, and then we're going to look at how does that impact then our understanding of this passage. So... If you're in Ephesus, this is your goddess. This is Artemis, okay? They had a massive temple where they worshiped Artemis. Also, this woman, Galan, right here, she's a professor of mine, a mentor of mine. She's academic goals for me. She wrote uh, two articles. She has a book coming out soon from IVP all about this Artemis worship. This is where she has spent a ton of time. So I'm ripping all her material off, every bit of it. So if I say anything that sounds interesting, it's from her. And if I say something that sounds stupid and I got it wrong, that's from me. So here's, here's Ephesus. You're in Ephesus. Paul is writing to Timothy, who's in Ephesus. And this Artemis worship is the backdrop, bigger than the Cowboys, okay? This is like what the people of Ephesus would have known and understood and believed in. So for a long time, people wrongly thought Artemis was a fertility goddess. And the reason why they wrongly thought that is because they see these things and they assume those are breasts. Those are not breasts. And some of the other statues that we found, it's just a part of her clothing. These are different animals that she killed. And her clothing was always different than the color of her skin. Excuse me. Also that, um, the, I, those are not what breasts look like. So anyways, I, it's a weird thing, but that's what male archaeologists assumed those were. Goddesses are weird. So they just said, okay, that's what it is. And that's who she is. However, over time, more archaeology has been discovered and has helped us get a better understanding of what Artemis worship actually looked like. And if I were not a Christian, I would be tempted to worship Artemis because she is awesome. Okay, so the Mediterranean city of Ephesus, extremely wealthy. One of the biggest players in the ancient world. I mean, this is a big city. This is like Paul writing to Timothy and he's in Dubai or he's in New York City or you think of like the big Monaco, I don't know, but like Jewel City, when you think of like the big cities of the world with industry and wealth and class and all that, that's what Ephesus is. And it's one of the wealthiest provinces in the Roman Empire. And in the last half century, so think about it, in the last 50 years, the discovery of Ephesus, they're digging it out and their archaeological finds have shed a ton of new information on the New Testament. Not that it's like fundamentally changed any basic like Christian creed. It's not like we're rewriting the creeds, but it's helped us understand these letters to the Ephesians, these letters to Timothy who's in Ephesus, these letters to, to first and second and third John. Like it is a really significant archeological dig. Um, and so perhaps one of the most important things that we've discovered though is about Artemis and how big cult worship was during the time of, of Timothy's day there. Okay, so one of the reasons why it is such a big deal is if you look in the letter to Corinth, Paul says, hey, I think everyone should be single. If you look in this letter to 1 Timothy, he tells the young widows, y'all need to get married. And you look at that and you go, huh? But if you look at the context of Corinth, Corinth, debauchery, those people had what we call an over-realized eschatology. In other words, they're like, we're in the end times. We can do whatever we want, which is why he's like, hey, there's a man among you who sleeps with his mother-in-law or his stepmother, I believe. And he's like, mm -mm. so he calls them to celibacy because there's too much sex in Corinth. Well, in Ephesus, what's interesting about Artemis is we wrongly thought she was the goddess of fertility. We have since discovered, no, she is the virgin goddess of midwifery which is a huge difference. And we're gonna learn her story in a second, but basically she asks her dad, she, she's born, she's one of a twin. Her, her twin is Apollo, so Artemis and Apollo. Her mom gives birth to her first, and then she labors for 10 days, writhing in pain to deliver her brother. And because gods and goddesses are born with their full faculties, she's not some baby watching her mom writhe in pain. She's a full goddess with full faculties, midwifing her mother, to the point of giving birth. And so she goes to her father, Zeus, and she says, hey dad, I do not want to ever be struck with Cupid's arrow or Eros's arrow. Like, I don't wanna fall in love, so I wanna be a virgin. I want to hunt and I wanna help women because I don't want anybody to have to go through what my mom went through. That context tells you there were Artemis worshiping women who then would have taken vows of virginity and celibacy, not to honor the Lord, but to be like Artemis which is why Paul's like, hey, get married. You're doing this for all the wrong reasons. And it makes sense of why he has these disparate pieces of advice in these two different cities. Because what these two different cities were dealing with, 
very different context. And again, first rule of interpretation, context is everything. Um, okay, so reading Acts 19, 21 through 21 in the First Timothy 1, 3. The Acts 19 passage is about, um, if you will remember, uh, Paul, <laughs> Paul is causing people to stop buying little Artemis statues. And if you remember the guy, Demetrius, it was, I think his name was Demetrius, it starts with a D. Anyways, he gets super ticked off. And he's like, hey, he, this isn't about my money. This is about they're going to bring shame to Artemis. Like, they're trying to disparage our goddess. And so they begin chanting and screaming, and it creates this massive riot, okay, which gives you a picture of just how big Artemis worship was. People would buy little statues of Artemis because they wanted, you know, you want to take your goddess with you on the road. Um, and that, that's what Paul is, like, talking to Timothy. Like, Paul's been in these places. He knows how big Artemis worship is. He knows that people are going to try and kill you if you get in the way of the cult of worship because the cult of worship comes with money. So, popular myth, Artemis was the virgin daughter of Leto and Zeus. Um, by the way, Zeus has a wife named Hera. So, the legend goes, Zeus has sex with Hera. She gets pregnant with twins. I mean, excuse me, Zeus has um, sex with Leto. He gets pregnant with twins. Hera finds out and is super ticked. So, she banishes Leto to this, like, far-off island. And then that's where Leto, not having the help to give birth, gives birth to her daughter. Ten days later, he gives birth to the brother. So, so think about this. In the creation story of Artemis, the woman comes first. And then second comes the man. Put that somewhere up in your brain. We'll come back to that. She's the goddess of the hunt. She's pretty great. Um, according to legend, at birth, gods and goddesses, I've already told you this story. She's, you know, she doesn't want Aphrodite's arrows, 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 eros is the Greek way of, of talking about that. Anyways. Special sympathy for women in travail in their first days can be associated with virginity and midwifery. Artemis is not the goddess of fertility. She is the goddess of virginity and midwifery. Okay, so let me keep. <laughs> she was born, the woman was born first, then the man, virgin midwifery. Okay, we'll keep going. Um, this is the, what we think, this is a remade temple, so this would have been her temple. It dominated the landscape of Ephesus. So all these archeological digs, like they're realizing like, this is the city center. Like this is, like you're not gonna walk around Ephesus and people be like, oh, hail Artemis. You know, who's Artemis? Like, not gonna happen. Uh, and so Antipater, he's the general left in command of Macedonia and Greece after Alexander's death. After seeing the Artemisian, her, her thing, he says, I have set eyes on the wall of lofty Babylon, on which is a road for chariots, and the statue of Zeus by the Alpheus, and the hanging gardens, and the Colossus of the Sun, and the huge labor of the high pyramids, and the vast tomb of Mausolus. But when I saw, so if y'all, these are the seven ancient wonders of the world as he's listing off. Like these are not like, oh, I've seen like the donut shop on the corner. Like he's like, I've seen the pyramids, I've seen the big Zeus statue. I've seen the roads that lead to Babylon, right? And he's like, but when I laid my eyes on Artemis that mounted to the clouds, those other marvels lost their brilliancy. And I said, lo, apart from Olympus, the sun never looked on aught so grand. So here's this general basically saying, woof, this is, this is quite a temple, okay? So again, Artemis worship is dominating the landscape of Ephesus. Homer wrote about her, nor does laughter-loving Aphrodite ever tame in love Artemis. So again, she's the virginal daughter. She's never bit by the love Cupid arrow by Aphrodite. She is the huntress with shafts of gold, for she loves archery and the slaying of wild beasts in the mountains and the lyre and also the dancing and the thrilling cries in shady woods and cities of upright men. She's a partier, a virgin partier midwife. She's weird. Mm -hmm. But... That's who she is. Um, rather than presenting Artemis as a domesticated wife and mother, Homer again, undomesticated virgin. Wild virgin, party girl, not settling down to help you through midwifery. Uh, so, why is she such a big goddess? In the ancient world, you have gods and goddesses that meet your needs. You, you create gods and goddesses for like whatever your problems are. So like, you need the sun to rise and fall. So you have a, a god of the sun. You need a god or a goddess to control 
the water. So you've got Poseidon, or you've got like you need gods and God, you need a goddess of love. You have Aphrodite. You need a god like so. In the first century, the primary cause of death for men was war. There are gods and goddesses that protect you in war. You better believe it. Nike and all these other guys, right? But for women, the number one cause in the first century was death at childbirth. Wouldn't it be great if you had a goddess of midwifery? Oh, 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 right, you're tracking with me. Researchers estimated that for the empire to maintain a minimum number of zero population growth, which means to not decline, so they could just remain steady. And just, just for that, the average wife had to bear five children. The pressure on wives to reproduce was great. Emperors provided incentives and politicians passed laws relating to remarriage and childbearing to keep armies staffed. As the primary goddess associated with midwifery, Artemis played an enormous role on a culture that depended on marriage and reproduction for its survival. You need Artemis if you're in the ancient world. And you know that the most dangerous thing you can do is give child a birth to a child and you've got to do it five times to just keep up with what the empire needs. That's why the empire loves Artemis, okay? Uh, according to a geographer writing during the era in question, so when we're talking about, the prevailing belief about Ephesus' history was that the Amazons, yeah, Gal Gadot, Wonder Woman, Amazons, while not the founders of the city, had lived around the temple seeking protection from its goddess. That's the kind of goddess Artemis is. Strong, independent, female-centric, undomesticated huntress help you in midwifery i mean this is this is wild okay you can see why i like her um the ephesians goddess or the ephesian versions of the goddess the picture with the midriff and sometimes also a neckline with bulbous objects so in the uh, in like story times and things like that sometimes the way you see artemis like depicted is like this okay that's not when we excavate ephesus this is what they see very different images, okay? Very different images. But again, this is why people thought she was the goddess of uh, fertility. But that's those are just like some people think maybe to protect her. Some people think pearls. I don't. I don't know. I don't know what it is. But uh, people at the time and the earliest Christians appear to have seen and heard the ability. Okay, this is what's so important. They believed Artemis had the ability to deliver a woman through life's most dangerous passage, which was childbirth. As the number one cause of death in women with childbirth, Ephesus, fully female, yet undomesticated goddess, was viewed as presiding at birth without herself being associated with sex, fertility, or nurturing. She is a fiercely independent, virginal, undomesticated, huntress, bad mamma jamma, who also happens to help with midwifery. Okay, that's the backdrop. This is who Artemis is. This is who every Ephesian woman prior to every let me say that not the Jewish Ephesian women so Jewish people they did not participate in this there might have been some synchron synchronistic type of like there might have been Jewish women who were like Artemis is neat but Jewish people by and large stood out in the Roman Empire because of their conservative values like most of us would have like if if we were somehow transported back into the ancient world almost all of us would feel more at home in Jewish places and homes than in uh pagan gentile homes unless you're a wild child in which case teach their own but anyways so uh, if you are a woman just an average woman who happens to live in ephesus you're going to worship artemis and because you become what you behold if you are a woman who is unmarried you might try and stay unmarried if you have your own wealth or if you are un if you are married and your husband dies at war you're not going to remarry because you want to be like Artemis. You want to be sexually free from the fear of childbirth. And this is what Paul is coming up against in the domination of Artemis worship. Okay, The other thing is Artemisian cult worship was known for exorbitant luxury. So the Ephesus was on the coastline, so they had pearls. Where did we hear that from? Uh, and they had gold. And it was normal for the Ephesian women to try and dress like Artemis, with these elaborate hairstyles. Elaborate hairstyles, okay? Okay. So then all of a sudden we open up 1 Timothy. We've got this Artemisian cult in our background. We're thinking about it. So the NASB and the NIV 1984 translations, they talk about in the, in the book of 1 Timothy, they're like, hey, there seems to be these, these men who are false teachers. 
but it doesn't have to be translated as men. Trombley points out that the Greek text actually uses a neuter pronoun, tisim, perhaps better translated, certain persons. Or there's some among you. It could be men or women. This detail is significant, is that opens up the possibility that at least a few of the teachers of false doctrine that Paul is writing to Timothy about and he's concerned about in Ephesus were women. Internal evidence elsewhere also points to this possibility. The reference in 5.13 to younger widows going from house to house is similar to how the church is described as meeting from house to house. In other words, what's probably happening in Ephesus is you've got these false teachers. Some of these false teachers might be young women who are teaching what exactly? Well, if they've been indoctrinated into Artemisian cult worship, it would be very normal for women to take the lead and it would be very normal for them to be teaching things of Artemis, not things of the Lord. And these widows are going house to house and Paul's like, hey, you have a problem. Those widows need to marry. Why would he tell them to marry? Is it because they're just busy bodies? Like people love to interpret for Timothy like, oh, these young women, they're just up to no good. Or maybe he's saying, hey, you're choosing to remain unmarried. It's not because you're honoring the Lord. It's because you're honoring Artemis. And so my encouragement to you would to not follow Artemis, but to follow Jesus. And therefore, you should get married to show your, your trust in the Lord, your continued faithfulness in the Lord and in these relationships. The TDNT, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, notes a general restraint for the use of soter in reference to God throughout the New Testament. Okay, So the TDNT says, listen, the word soter to talk about salvation is pretty rare. But it's more common in the pastorals, which are these letters that Paul writes to Timothy. Three of the ten instances of soter in the pastorals are in 1 Timothy, and a fourth is in 2 Timothy. And interestingly enough, 1 Timothy 4.10, soter is used as a title. Contrast this with the rather rare later use of this word in apostolic fathers. Why does that matter? Because in Ephesus, they would go around saying, Artemis is soter. Artemis is savior. You'd have inscriptions all over the city. Artemis is soter, soter, soter with Artemis. And here comes Paul. No, 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 no. Theos, God is soter. Again, he's using the jargon of the Ephesians to, to counteract their claims. You say Artemis is, is soter? No. God is soter. It's the same thing he does in Philippians. In Philippians, in Philippians 2, they would go around saying, Caesar is Lord, Caesar is Lord, Caesar is Lord. And Paul goes, no, 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 Jesus is Lord. And at his name, every knee will bow, right? He's doing things that have to do with the context in which they're in. Philippians was a big, like, city, like, Caesar was their thing. And here you've got Ephesus, and Artemis is their thing. And here's Paul using this very rare, not extremely rare, but somewhat rare use of the term soter, and he's using it to counteract Artemis as soter language. Numerous words and phrases in 1 Timothy have strong connections with Artemis worship and opposition to it. Some of them are savior, abstinent, prohibit marriage, as well as reference to childbearing. Numerous people within the church who are sexually inactive. Like, why are all, none of y'all having sex? When in Corinth, everyone's having sex. Well, if your goddess is a non-sex having goddess, you might be doing that. Um, Christ's humanity, Christ's flesh right we don't serve a god who you can't touch and feel we serve a god with flesh and he's fully god and fully man as internal evidence suggests that this epistle is intended for a recipient who resided in ephesus perhaps the presence of the highly influential virgin-led cult accounts for the emphasis of such words the influence of the cult's celibate goddess may explain why the church in artemis city was so filled with single women whether they be young old causing difficulty or needing to marry and have children and the teaching of some forbidding marriage. Okay? We can see Artemis all over this book if we will. Let her learn. So when I read that chapter to you, 1 Timothy 2, narrowing in, 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 15, let her learn is the chapter's only imperative. And we miss that all the time. It's the only command in the chapter, let her learn. Often readers miss this, focusing on the limitations that follow. The concern, so here's, here's how we synthesize it. The concern is not that women are teaching. The concern is that these women in Ephesus who have been cult Artemis worship leaders, they're the ones teaching Christianity and they're getting it wrong. And this letter to Timothy from Paul is saying, hey, you've got a problem with these women. And my solution is not shut them up forever because they're unworthy to teach. My solution is let them learn first. 
Teach them, Timothy. Let them learn from older Christians so that they can then teach properly. That seems to be the thrust of what's going on in this passage. So the concern was not about receiving a theological education, but the manner of doing so. The word here for quietly, which is how wives needed to learn, does not denote absolute silence, but rather quietness. Elsewhere, translators have rendered the word as settle down. In Timothy's context, at the very least, during gathered fellowship, husbands were angry, possibly because their wives were learning, and learning wives were acting in a way that undermined marital unity. The issue here is not this universal women can never teach, but more so probably something that's happening in Ephesus. And if you're in a culture where women are the highest goddess and women are leading cultic worship, Paul's coming in here going, hey, th this is not going to work in Christianity. And I'm not saying it's not going to work because the women can never teach. I'm saying it's not working here because they're not ready to do so. One might also see an Artemis influence in Paul's reference to limiting women or wives teaching. He gives the reason, blah, blah, blah. This is too much. But let's go back. Okay. So going back. Artemis dresses in gold. I mean, her shafts are made of gold. Her hair is extravagantly braided, which is something only wealthy women could afford. And often it was slaves who performed that labor. And now you're talking about a church being formed in Ephesus where you have slave and free, poor and rich, male and female, meant to come together in a unified whole. The dividing wall of hostility has been knocked down, is what Paul says to the Ephesians in the book of, Eph in the book of to the Ephesians. He says, listen, who you are now is one people of God where God has brought Jew and Gentile together and he's knocked down the dividing wall so that Jew and Gentile can now get along and slave and free can now get along. And you guys are coming out of a cult worship where you wear gold and pearls and ridiculous braided hair that just signifies to everybody, look at me, I'm rich. And he's saying, don't do that. This is less about modesty of like sexual modesty and more about wealth modesty. Why? Because the women of Artemis, Ephesian cults, were dressing like her. And he's like, don't do that. Secondly, I do not permit a wife or woman to teach or exercise authority over a man or husband. Why? Because they don't know what they're doing. And not only that, they would say things like, Adam or Eve came first, or the woman came first. Artemis came first, then Apollo. And Paul goes, listen, no, Adam came first. Our creation story is not the Artemisian story. Our creation story was in Eden, and God made Adam and Eve. God, not like Zeus had sex with some other woman who then gave, like, that's not our creation story. That's not the story we all belong to. That's not the story we're being grafted into. The story we're being grafted into, dear Christians, brothers and sisters, is of Adam and Eve. So stop telling the story that the women came first. And then this whole save through childbearing. You've got a bunch of young widows going door to door teaching that what? Well, chances are what they were teaching is that Artemis will save you in childbearing. Artemis will be there for you. And Paul goes, no. No, God is the one who saves. It's not Artemis Soter, it's Theos Soter. It's Jesus Christos Soter, right? And so this is what I think is happening in this passage. I believe that if we were getting this letter 2,000 years ago and we lived in Ephesus, we would immediately know what Paul is talking about. We don't have that advantage. Or frankly, I like indoor plumbing. It's fine. I don't mind not living in Ephesus. Although the weather would be nice. Anyways, I don't mind living in the year 2022 in the year of our Lord in a COVID pandemic. Maybe I do want to live in the first century. Especially in Ephesians. The women had tons of power. Anywho, back to my point. We don't live then. <laughs> we've, got, we've got some cultural boundaries here to understand. But the more we learn about Artemis, the more we learn about the context of Ephesus, the more we culturally like humble ourselves to try and understand the world in which this letter was written, it seems to give some clarity to some of the weirder parts of this letter. Because there's some weird parts. Why would Paul say you're going to be saved through childbearing unless he's counteracting this Artemis you're going to be saved through childbearing cult worship thing? Like, Why does he care how the women dress here unless how they're dressing is causing division and it's rep and they say look how you dress they're saying i belong to artemis but i'm showing up to, ch to church on sunday saying i belong to jesus you're going look, look, look you belong body soul dress hair to jesus so act like it right 
So I believe when you have this context, it helps you to understand it was good and right for Paul to tell these women, stop teaching, not stop learning, learn. You need to learn. You need to learn your Eden story. You need to learn your creation story. You need to go, but there's a lot of scripture you don't understand. And you got a lot of Artemisian in you that you're going to have to shuck off. So you need to take a season of settling down and learning, which is a good and beautiful and right thing. And then after that season, then do what you see Priscilla do. Do what you see Phoebe do. Do what you see fill in the blank do. So here's just some thoughts. If you're going to hang your view of women in the church on one verse, it should probably not be this heavily debated and confusing. I just, I mean, I fundamentally believe that the scripture that is clear should help us understand the scriptures that are unclear. And if you're going to say this, 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 15, clarifies everything I need to know about women in the church, then I would say, hey, I, I don't think you're being honest with the best information that we have, especially not in the last 50 years. I think you need to look again, okay? That, I mean, that's just why I think we have the whole breadth of scripture that we need to have speak into this. It's why I did not start here. It's why I started in Eden and made our way through all the way to this passage. Because if you start here, you're not going to get where I believe you're supposed to go. You never let unclear help determine clear. And I think I used this example in the class. It'd be like saying, I want to know everything you need to know about circumcision. You would not start with Moses' wife taking out a flint knife, circumcising her son, and throwing it at the feet of her husband. Like, what? You would start in Genesis where God commands it, you would start in other passages that are a lot more clear about circumcision, and then you would use that to help you make sense of what's happening in that passage. You start with the clear and you move to unclear, and when it's unclear, you arrive there humbly and curiously, curi with curiosity, trying to say, what does this mean? Because this is a weird passage. It doesn't seem to comport with the rest of what I've learned. Okay, so what's our so what? Context is king, and scholars know this. Okay, like th this is this is seminary 101. <laughs> this is so much of what you do in seminary. In fact, my doctoral I'm getting a doctorate of ministry in New Testament context. All I'm doing is reading books that helps me understand the world of the New Testament. That's what I'm doing. Because if I can understand that world, it can help me make sense of these really precious pieces of scripture that we have. And to deny that to say we don't need any of that, that the Bible's clear, I got what I need, like that, at, at worst, that's manipulation and abuse. Um, at best, it's just a naivety that speaks to an ignorance that can be cured, okay? This is what it means to study your scriptures. It's called study for a reason. Let Paul's words to you, let them learn, like settle down and learn something here. So when people get worked up and they don't wanna consider the context, all of scripture is contextualized. All, all of that is stuff we have to learn and go back into the world in which the letter was received to help us better understand what God was trying to say to them and to us today. How do we synthesize the seemingly contradictory scriptures? Like I said, you go from clear to unclear, not the other way. Okay, so I, look, the accusation that so many people that arrive where Martin and I have arrived, where we believe that women are allowed to preach and teach and do the sacraments and minister we didn't get there by conveniently ignoring these passages and that's the accusation that's thrown our way it's like oh you just you just ignore first Timothy and I'm like no I don't but you guys also seem to ignore big chunks of Acts and all of Romans 16 and and tons of first Corinthians like I like the gospels for crying out like like who's ignoring what and I don't think it's fair that either group if they're if they're Putting a good faith effort to understand, I think both camps, tribes, whatever, are really trying to wrestle with the text, okay? And so we have to move from clear to less clear as a general rule of thumb, but I also understand how some people can arrive at this and go, that's just too big of a hurdle for me to jump over, and I get that. But it's not a fair accusation to say that we're ignoring that. Um, Okay, if you're going to make a decision that affects 60% of your body, the best numbers that we have today is the American church. The American, yeah, the American, uh, I think it's evangelical church is about 60% female, 60%. So the majority of our women, please don't hang it all 
on some verses that are highly debated and unclear. I understand if you don't arrive where I arrive, but don't let these be the only verses that you wrestle with. Go back to what Daryl Box says. Let these verses like marinate in them. Let them speak to the condition. Uh, and it's unfair to say we're going with a plain reading of the text. Like head coverings, we don't wear long hair. Men aren't supposed to have long hair. We don't do that. Greet each other with a holy kiss. We don't do like there's no plain reading of the text that we all just follow. Like that's insane. Like so that's just lazy and that's an accusation that I'm just like you can miss me with that. Okay. Uh, yeah. I think hopefully I've convinced you all of this that we Take the Bible seriously, as saying to you, but it is really an unfair accusation to accuse those who are affirming the teaching gifts of women that they're not taking the Bible seriously. It is unfair. Um, it's an accusation that gets thrown at me from time to time, uh, which is fine. But I want to just tell you all, like, I recognize that for many of you, your position, because you choose to be a part of St. Jude, probably makes you a minority in some of your friend and social groups. Um, and maybe that's a that's a that's a sandpaper thing for you. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe for you it's like, hey, I don't, you know, this isn't a, this isn't a hill I'm going to die on. I'm fine. Um, but if this is a rub for you, I just want you to know, like, you're standing in a camp with a lot of really brilliant scholars who are humble and thoughtful, and they love Jesus, and they've wrestled, and many of them started as complementarians and arrived at egalitarian, okay? So, like, Hear me, this is not just some position that because we're progressive and cool, we, we got to our position and then backtracked and made our way through the scriptures to get there. No, like for so many, the scriptures are how they arrived at this position through the leading of the spirit. And so I think you're in good company. You may not feel that in your specific context, but if you need me to, I'll introduce you to other saints that stand with you in these thoughts. Um, the world is full of misogyny and hatred of women, and we should be different. I mean, even if you're a complementarian, like, gosh, you should go out of your way to love women. <laughs> you should go out of your way to love the disenfranchised. You should go out of your way to make sure that those who feel like they have no voice in the church don't feel that way. Uh, we should be a place where men and women can thrive, can thrive. Uh, and be free, people. Be free. If God is calling you to use your gifts, use them. Use them. All right. If nobody's told you today that they love you, I do. But way more importantly, God is crazy at you all. Uh, grace and peace, friends. And if you're listening to this for the first time, we're about to start a Trinity class, so jump in with us.